this is a place uh, I uh, serve. Uh, it is the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, which was funded upon uh, the same idea as ICTP uh, 30 years ago. ICTP is 50 years. And, um, and basically, uh, this is an international organization, different from ICTP, it is uh, autonomous. Uh, and uh, so we are uh, um, supported by 64 countries, uh, which are shown here. And, and basically, we run advanced research uh, in uh, our laboratories in Trieste, New Delhi, and Cape Town. But at the same time, we give fellowships uh, to PhD students and postdocs from these member states. Uh, and uh, um, we organize meetings, courses, uh, schools, like this one, uh, everything in the field in the field of biotechnology. Physically, we are uh, located in this area here. So basically, now we are basically here. So we are, um, it's about a 15 minutes drive from, from here to the, to the uh, IC, ICGB. So uh, I start with, uh, with uh, an apology. So I'm um, a medical doctor by, uh, by training. I've worked always uh, on uh, very gross subjects like uh, gene therapy and uh, uh, more recently cardiovascular disorders. So my talk will not be uh, 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 dealing with small objects in quantitative terms, as uh, this school would, uh, would imply. But uh, I will deal more with uh, big uh, objects like uh, organs or cells. And uh, you will see the approach will be very qualitative. But I think that uh, I will touch a subject that uh, might be of interest for you, uh, uh, both as a scientist, but also human beings. Because this subject, I think, uh, it is very critical in understanding uh, our human body and uh, uh, the problems that uh, we are facing and the modern medicine is essentially essentially uh, uh, facing excuse me for that uh, and this uh, um, the, the the subject is, is basically uh, led by one uh, important observation that uh, the human lifespan is uh, uh, has a fixed term as it has a fixed term, basically the lifespan of all uh, uh, living beings uh, on the planet. This uh, uh, is a picture of uh, uh, last year. And last year, the, the long, longest lived person was reported to be this uh, lady, Misao Kawa. She was born in 19, 1898. And after she celebrated his 117 uh, birthday a couple of months ago, uh, later, basically, uh, she uh, died. So the record now of a long-lived person is uh, this other lady here. She is Italian, actually. She lives uh, in the province of Vercelli in the northern, uh, northwestern part uh, of Italy. And uh, her name is Emma Morano, and she is reported to be at uh, 116. So these are a testimony of a, a long-lived person. And uh, this fits very well with the concept that we have that uh, the uh, uh, life expectancy has grown a lot uh, over the last uh, uh, century. If you take life expectancy, so how, life expectancy is a statistical measure to say uh, uh, how many people would be live out of 100 in uh, a certain number of uh, time. And, and basically, life expectancy at the beginning of the century, last century, was 49 years. And uh, after only uh, one century, so in the early 2000s, it rose to 76 years. So this is in industrial countries. If you look at the statistics now, these are the latest statistics of the World Health Organization a couple of years ago. In Italy, for example, a, male, a man has a life expectancy of more than 80 years, and a woman life expectancy of 85 years. The, the top uh, living countries are Iceland for men, 81, and Japan for women, women 86. So this, uh, you want to ask something? Yes. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Sure, sure, sure. Let me come to that. Yes, yes. So th these are the, the official statistics. So we, we are witnessing this uh, huge, uh, huge increase. 
And, uh, but the interesting point here is a, a study that was published uh, a couple of weeks ago in Nature that uh, is a very simple study. It was performed by, by a group in the United States and Cornell University. And they took 40 countries and 155 uh, years of observation. And they simply asked how do this uh, uh, life expectancy data uh, stratify according to the period of observation in terms uh, of uh, uh, um, age of the person. So, so the question was, uh, if you have an increase from 49 to 76 and now to 85, which is uh, the category of people, the age of people who have benefited more? And, uh, and as your colleague anticipated, it's very obvious that uh, a big part of the increase in life expectancy was uh, a decrease in uh, perinatal and infant mortality which has occurred uh, thanks to social economical reasons, uh, thanks to medicine and so on. Then uh, there has been increase also from 10 years to 20 years of age, from 20 to 30, 30 to 40 and so on. But what happened is that if you analyze data from 90 to 100, to 100 to 110, 110 to 120, the increase uh, has been uh, minimal and uh, unexistent from 110, 100. And, and 20. So basically, what we have gained in this uh, uh, last century is not an increase of the maximum lifespan of uh, the species of Homo sapiens, but just an increase in a reduction in the cause of mortalities from zero years of age up to 90 or 100 uh, years. So we are not expanding lifespan, we are just expanding life uh, in uh, this definite uh, period uh, of time. In other terms, uh, we have a, a fixed uh, lifespan as uh, uh, human species, uh, as Homo sapiens species, and this is set to be around 120, 125. In fact, uh, the, the person who has been reported so far officially to be, have been, uh, to have the record for having long lived is th this lady here, Jean Calman, uh, she's a French, uh, she was a French lady uh, who died in 1997 at 122.5 years. And nobody has surpassed it. So uh, even from 1995 up to now, so in the last 20 years, uh, nobody has been reported to have lived longer than this lady. It seems that uh, basically there is a wall after uh, that we can surpass uh, um, by, by, by any means. And uh, this wall, so this wall of the fixed lifetime, is uh, the same that exists for all species on, <coughs> on the planet, as I said. For example, a mouse lives two years, a rat lives three years, a sheep 12 years, turtles are very long-lived animals, it's 150 years, dogs, uh, that's a common experience, it's from 15 to 30 years, the Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly, three months, and so on. So basically, there is a sort of biological program inside uh, each species that sets the maximum lifespan of that species. If you ask me what is this biological program, nobody knows. To me, it is one of the most fascinating mysteries of biology. So simply understanding why a mouse lives two years and uh, a man lives 120 years even if they share 97% of the genetic information, and basically they have the same anatomy and the same physiology, grossly speaking, but they go from two years to 120 years. That really would be a marvelous, uh, a marvelous uh, uh, um, invention or a marvelous understanding. What we know that's very interesting is that uh, if you take uh, 100 persons uh, and uh, you ask uh, when will these persons uh, uh, die? One could expect that uh, if we have 120 years, the, after one year there are uh, uh, 99, then 98, 97, so that there is a, a line starting from 100 and reaches zero in 120 years. Instead, the situation is very different. So basically, if you take humans or also mice, uh, C. elegans, uh, even uh, the, the budding yeast, so the most simple unicellular organism, you see that most people are alive for most of their life, 
and then they start dying just at the end of their life very, very rapidly. So it's not a straight line from here to here, but it, there is a period by which more than 90% of the population is alive, and then it drops down uh, suddenly, which is suggestive of a program, a program by which uh, everything works for a certain time, and then suddenly it starts not working uh, uh, not working uh, uh, anymore. Again, what is this program and why it differs so much uh, among the species uh, is uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely not known. By the way, this has uh, tremendous implications uh, for medicine because if you take uh, the uh, need for uh, sanitary assistance, for health assistance for people and the expenses that society <clears throat> uh, um, uh, have to make uh, to ensure survival and assistance of people, these are concentrated in the, the last five years of life. So basically one person spends, every person spends 95% <clears throat> of their whole uh, uh, life expenditures in medicine in the last five years of life. And this is what also the society does. So the, this has uh, tremendous implications uh, for, uh, for uh, health policies in the uh, Western countries. Please. Please. Yes, this is, these are the curves uh, in terms, uh, th this is a lifespan of C. elegans, which is a maximum lifespan is 25 days. And you see that 90% uh, uh, of the population reaches 20 days and they, they suddenly start dying. More or less, this is the same for uh, humans and the mice. Sorry? You're not changing scale. The fact is that you have a fixed program that sets your maximum lifespan. And then for 90% of this program, you are alive. And then the organs start dying. The question is why this happens. So why do we age and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and how do we age? Uh, uh, the molecular mechanisms uh, are, are, are really uh, not well understood, uh, but, but there are more than 300 different theories of aging. And when there are many theories, uh, and uh, we will see them, uh, uh, some of them in a minute, uh, it means that we don't have a, a real explanation for this. We can uh, conceive why we age, because uh, um, uh, we are here on the planet, uh, not because we have been created for our own sake or for the sake of our body, but because simply we fulfill a, 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 a mechanical purpose of transferring our genes. So evolution on the planet is driven by DNA, is it driven by genes. So basically what is immortal on the planet are genes, and our bodies are simple vehicles to transfer these genes. Uh, this has been first uh, uh, conceived by um, an evolutionary biologist uh, and a fantastic uh, uh, science communicator who is uh, Richard Dawkins uh, in uh, uh, publishing this book, The Selfish Gene, in 1976. So this book really has signed a landmark uh, moment uh, for understanding how life is on, on this planet. Think that he published this book, The Selfish Gene, so genes driving evolution and not the bodies driving evolution, uh, before publishing any paper in uh, any big journal. So basically, he came out for this book for the lay educated pub, uh, public, uh, and, and this has really shifted our understanding of life. So uh, to my students, uh, this is a must. They don't pass uh, my exam if they don't know this book. So I recommend to all of you who have not uh, read it. How many people have read this book? Fantastic. I recommend all the others to do, to do so. It's still very, very modern. And so basically, once we have transferred our genes to our progeny, then we become irrelevant for them on the planet, or even worse, we become competitor to access to the resources. So evolutionary, it makes a very good sense that we are wiped out. 
And uh, for the human species and for some, several mammal species, uh, the period after transferring the genes, so the period when fertilization occurs uh, and the period of death is very long afterwards because our babies are born in a condition by which they are not self-sufficient and not sufficiently mature to survive on the planet. So basically, the differentiation and development in humans finish by the age of uh, 18 years of age. And so basically, there is a need that the parents and the grandparents really survive for a sufficiently long period of time. So this is why our maximum lifespan is so extended after the period when our sexual organs are, are mature. So we can conceive the reason. We don't understand the mechanisms. Uh, and certainly, out of these 300 theories, there are 12 theories that uh, um, makes a, a lot of sense. Uh, certainly, uh, there is a deterioration of uh, our organs, which is due to accumulation of damage into DNA, into macromolecules, which is not repair. There is an incapacity of the cells uh, progressively to divide because they accumulate uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, damage. There is a shortening of the extremities of our um, um, uh, telomeres on the chromosomes, uh, so in capacity of driving DNA, full DNA uh, replication in the cells. And uh, uh, the, there are uh, accumulation of errors due to the incapacity of uh, the um, DNA repair machinery to repair these errors or their uh, repairing these errors uh, by int introduction of mutations. But all of this, I mean, uh, um, still doesn't explain why a mouse lives two years and, and a human lives 120 years. What we certainly understand is that there is a strong correlation between the aging and death and the exhaustion of the regenerative capacity of organs after birth. So basically, there is a really a correlation by which uh, critical organs in our body, like the heart, the brain, and uh, the, the, the bone marrow, uh, are capable of uh, uh, dealing with the need for renewal of cells in this organ. And uh, while this fades, there is also a progression towards aging and death. Somebody believes that this is not just a correlation, but this is the cause of, uh, of aging. So we age because we are incapable of renewing our cells and renewing the tissues and the organs where our cells are uh, uh, located. Uh, for example, you know, you have seen, I'm sure, in this course, so this picture in uh, several different flavors. I will show this also a few times during my presentation. You know that all of us are uh, the product of uh, an egg from our mother, uh, fertilized by a sperm cell from our father. Then this cell is the first cell that defines the organism. It de divides uh, two times, uh, four times, three times, four times. At this stage of uh, 150 cells, it forms uh, a sphere with uh, a mass on one side of the sphere. This is called the inner cell mass. The, the wall of the sphere will give rise to the placenta, the other fetal nexus, the inner cell mass, to the new organism. This is called the blastocyst. And then uh, immediately after the blastocyst, which is formed about uh, four or five days after fertilization, there is uh, a tremendous reorganization of cells uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the embryo, uh, which is called gastrulation, by which uh, three layers are formed, mesoderm, endoderm, and ectoderm. And from uh, each of these three layers, uh, there is a further specification of uh, specific cell types. So, for example, from the ectoderm, uh, the skin and the brain will develop from the mesoderm, uh, the blood, the, ma the skeletal muscle, the heart uh, uh, muscle, the kidney, from the endoderm, uh, all the, the glands and uh, uh, the, internal, the internal glands and, and, and uh, uh, the lungs. So this specification is a, a functional specification that forms about 240 different cell types. So my body and your body is formed by about 10 to the 14 cells, uh, each of which has a specific cell type, has a cell function, and to form 240 different cell types. So a neuron is a cell type, an epithelial cells, uh, red blood cells, or a cardiomyocyte is a cell type. During this process, most of the cell, at a certain point when they get specified, they also stop 
in dividing. So they get terminally differentiated. For example, you can take from the heart of an adult individual the contractile cells, cardiomyocytes, and you can put them in culture. They are these beautifully brick-shaped cells, very big, very large cytoplasm. Sometimes they are binucleated. These striations are the sarcomeres or the contractile apparatus. These cells can be kept in culture. You can do all molecular biology you want. You can do all electrophysiology you want, your immunofluorescence, and all the studies you want in culture. They can survive several days. There is no way of having these cells replicating. So after birth, these cells don't replicate. So we immediately lose the capacity of regenerating the heart immediately at birth. We came to this conclusion in, a, in an inequivocal manner through a study which was conducted by the Karolinska Institute a few years ago. And this is a, a very fancy study because it took advantage of the fact that in the 50s and in the 60s, the big nuclear powers like the United States, Russia, but also France, started detonating atomic bombs in the atmosphere. And, uh, and, and so basically from the atmosphere, there was a, the, in the atmosphere there was a creation of a lot of uh, um, um, unstable uh, isotopes for several, several ions, including carbon. And since carbon is the basis of uh, uh, all biochemistry in living beings, there was a certain percentage of carbon incorporated into living beings, which was not C12 as in its normal stable state, but it was C14. And by accelerator max spectrometry, one can recover DNA from uh, a, a, a living being and uh, ask how much C14 is there. So if you do this, for example, in the concentric uh, rings in trees, you know that each ring marks one year, you ask uh, what is the concentration of uh, C14 starting uh, in, in, in the rings of a long-lived tree, you see that uh, the rings that were formed between the, before the 1960s, they have very low C14 content. And then starting from the late 50s and the 60s, the content uh, rose. Then at this uh, period, per moment, there was a, a treaty signed in St. Petersburg between uh, the uh, USSR at the moment and the United <coughs> States to stop this nuclear detonation. And so this uh, curve uh, started to go back to uh, normality. And it is expected that right in these days it should reach again background levels. But this means that if you take, for example, the brain, this was the first study that was performed, and uh, of, uh, let's start first with the gut. The gut, in contrary to the heart or the brain, renews every uh, two weeks. So we, we renew the epithelial cells in the gut or the epithelial cells on, in our skin every two weeks. So if, we, if I take epithelial cells in my gut or in my, in my skin and um, extract DNA and measure the C14 content, I can ask the question, is the C14 content uh, compatible with the um, um, today conditions or it has a, 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 the content is higher suggesting that the cells were produced before? And the answer is no, the C14 content is the same as today. But if you take the DNA from the brain, which was performed in this study here, then the DNA from the cortex of the brain is, uh, has the C14 content, which was uh, identical to that of the date of birth of the person. So indicating that uh, basically we are born with a certain number of neurons in our cortex, and these are never renewed. Uh, the, 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 the numbers say that uh, we are born with uh, perhaps a bit more than this number here, so 50 billion of neurons, and uh, we lose uh, 80 neurons every day. So while we're here speaking, you are losing neurons, I'm losing neurons, and uh, the capacity of regenerating these neurons during the adult life is zero. So we are programmed to be born with a certain number of neurons and no capacity to regenerate them. The same study uh, was performed after a, a few years. We are, we are 2009 in cardiomyocytes, and the conclusion is the same. A person at 72 years has more than 50% of his heart formed exactly by the same cells with which this person was born. So this means that uh, in my heart, in your heart, 
there are cardiomyocytes that will, will go along with us until the time of our death, which are exactly the same that has have been produced at the moment of our birth. And uh, this is remarkable because if you think these cells have a mechanical property of contracting, so these cells contract billions of time during uh, a lifespan, and they are exactly the same. They have, they have been formed exactly at that, at that moment. Now, having this notion that we are increasing our lifespan, but we cannot regenerate the organs, and that uh, our terminal maximum life uh, span is uh, fixed, would you be surprised to see that uh, starting from the 1900, when this expansion of, of uh, life expectancy has occurred, would you be surprised to see that uh, there is a, such a huge increase of degenerative conditions? So we have an enormous increase in cases of heart failure. We have degeneration of the cartilage with arthrosis. We have loss of beta cells in the pancreas with diabetes. We have a tremendous increase of degenerative disorders and, and so on and so forth. So medicine at the beginning of the 1900s was the medicine of infectious diseases. Now medicine is a medicine of degenerative diseases. We have to cope with the effects of prolonging life uh, expectancy without having the, uh, any tool to regenerate the organs that get, get lost. Even in, uh, in the organs that uh, are known to regenerate themselves, like the bone marrow, you know that uh, all cells in our body, uh, uh, so red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, come from an individual cell which is, uh, uh, during our life, uh, has a, a continuous turnover and in which a part of the progeny remains as a, a nematopoietic stem cells and part of the progeny differentiate to become a red blood cell, white blood cells and, and the platelet. This is the hematopoietic stem cells, stem cell which stays in, in, spongy, in spongy bones. So it is estimated that uh, if I take me and you, all cells in the body come from approximately 30,000 hematopoietic stem cells. So hematopoiesis is sustained by 30,000 stem cells that start, uh, they continue uh, replicating and differentiating. Consider that some types of white blood cells, granulocytes, have a half-life of four or five hours. And so they need to co be continuously produced by the bone marrow. Well, there have been scientists, this is a very remarkable study that uh, uh, there, are, uh, there are scientists in the uh, there have been scientists in the in the Netherlands who were interested to uh, um, uh, ask the question whether aging in an individual is due to the progressive accumulation in mutations in the genome. So basically, what they did was to take a certain number of individuals and uh, uh, um, measure the amount of mutations over years. And one of these individuals, they had. Uh, they were so lucky that uh, she, she was a lady, and she survived up to 115 years old before dying because of a cancer. And, uh, and basically, they had these samples for 40 years, and they measured the accumulation of mutations in the blood of this lady for 40 years. And, uh, and, and basically, they came to the conclusion that uh, mutations are not important for aging. So this lady, over 40 years, accumulated uh, 45 mutations. But the, the, our genome is made by 3 billion uh, per. So having 98% and, and, uh, doesn't code for proteins. So it is uh, either between genes or inside introns in genes. So having, finding that you accumulate 45 mutations uh, is probably telling us that uh, uh, there is no relationship uh, between aging and mutation, so basically it is not because we accumulate mutation that, uh, that, uh, that we age. But uh, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, by finding mutations, uh, these scientists had the opportunity of uh, using these uh, genetic variations as marker of the cells. A mutation always uh, occur not in the differentiated cells, but in the replicating cells. So basically, finding a mutation means also using this mutation as a marker of all the red blood cells, all the white cells, and all the, 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 the platelets that are formed from these cells. So it is a marker of clonality. And so they asked the question, how many clones, uh, when this person died, were sustaining her hematopoiesis? So how many stem cells this lady had out of the 30,000? And the answer was two. 
So all her hematopoiesis was sustained only by two hematopoiesis stem cells. So during her life, she has exhausted completely the capacity for regenerating, regenerating her, uh, her uh, um, hematopoietic system. So suppose that she didn't get a cancer and she survived an additional couple of years. After six months, she would have had one, and then after that, zero. And at that point, she would have died by aplastic anemia, so incapacity of producing blood cells. So to me, this is a fantastic example of this concept that aging is accompanied or perhaps caused by exhaustion of the regenerative capacities, even in organs that are known to be regenerative, like, like the bone marrow. The numbers are really impressive. So every uh, year, there are 15 million people diagnosed with heart failure, so incapacity of the heart to contract properly uh, in, in the world. And once you have a diagnosis of heart failure, heart failure is the condition but with the heart dilates, the walls become uh, very thin, and uh, there is uh, the incapacity of the pump to supply the sufficient amount of uh, uh, oxygen and nutrients that the body needs. And once a person is diagnosed with heart failure, the, this person has a probability of 50% of not being alive only after four years, which is a prognosis that is much worse than most cancers. In, uh, in, uh, uh, if you take persons after 80 years of age, one person out of three of them has a dementia, which in most cases is Alzheimer's disease. One person out of three after 80 years, we have just told you that life expectancy in industrialized countries is uh, more than 80 for men and more than 85 for women, a real epidemic here in Europe and the United States. There are more than 170 million people with diabetes who needs insulin because simply they have exhausted their beta cells in the pancreas and there is no possibility for beta cells to be regenerated. After 75 years of age, there are 30% of people don't see well because they have <coughs> had a degeneration of the retina and there is no possibility for retinal regeneration. And uh, again, after 75 years, one person out of two doesn't hear well because they have degeneration of the neuroepithelial cells in the inner ear and no possibility for regeneration. We even tend to think that uh, not hearing well is a sort of hallmark of aging because it is so common that we associate this with aging. But this is a pathology. This is due to the fact that you have degenerated these cells and uh, our body has not the capacity to regenerate that. Now, these conditions have in common that they are due to the loss of cells, have in common that this loss of cells is uh, irreversible, but also that they have in common that we have no therapy. There is uh, not a single drug that might induce uh, regeneration of the heart. There is uh, not only that, but the drugs that you have for heart failure are only drugs uh, that uh, are aimed at having the surviving cells contracting a bit better no way of regenerating these cells. And the last of these drugs was developed 20 years ago. So it means that a person now is treated with the same therapies as 20 years ago. We have zero drugs for Alzheimer's disease. There was a, a, a monoclonal antibody uh, a, from Eli Lilly that underwent a phase three clinical trial with a lot of promises for the previous experimentation. And last week, it failed in the phase three clinical trial. The Eli Lilly uh, uh, quotations in the, in, in, uh, in, in the market uh, drop 15% uh, suddenly in a few minutes when uh, this, the result of this trial was communicated. At this moment, we have no promise for, for anything for Alzheimer's disease. We have no way of regenerating beta cells. We have nothing to regenerate the retina. As you know, we have nothing to regenerate the inner ear. The only way is to, to try with devices to amplify the uh, hearing. And this is the reason why, please. It's, it's a fish, yes, can pause. Yes, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, re, 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 zebra fish has a, a fixed lifespan in, in uh, the, the day-long period, it, it, despite the fact that it regenerates its organs. But the fact is that uh, it regenerates some specific organs 
but uh, doesn't regenerate com them completely. So if you take uh, an aging zebrafish, the capacity of regeneration is uh, much lower than young zebrafish. So one might uh, uh, well argue that also in zebrafish, over time, you lose the regenerative capacities. Most of the experiments that we know in zebrafish or in the salamander or in uh, other amphibians are performed with young animals. If you look at the uh, aging animals, then the capacity of regeneration is much, uh, much lower. So the, the pyramid would fit, uh, would fit also there. The reason why there is no drug for these conditions, it is because the pharmaceutic uh, uh, industry basically is very well suited to develop uh, small chemical drugs, so small molecules. But it's very difficult, also conceivable, that a small molecule can, uh, could trigger regeneration of uh, an organ. It's much more conceivable that uh, if we want regeneration, we should uh, gear up a regenerative program, so a biological program. And, and now we have uh, different tools that are coming from biotechnology. So we can regenerate an organ, for example, implanting a stem cell or using a stem cell in culture to produce new cell types, new cells of that specific cell type to be implanted. Or we can use, uh, for example, growth factor that stimulate uh, this endogenous regeneration. Or we can use genes that stimulate uh, regeneration. And genes doesn't mean only uh, protein coding genes, but it means all regulatory genes in the domain of uh, small regulatory RNAs, long regulatory RNAs, uh, DNA that uh, sequester other RNAs in the cell, and so on. So all nucleic acid uh, therapeutics. So basically what I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you today now is what is the state of the situation with the stem cell applications for organ regeneration. And uh, tomorrow, instead, I will uh, deal with uh, the possibility of uh, stimulating endogenous regeneration of the heart using uh, microRNA. So tomorrow it will be more a cardiovascular um, uh, presentation showing our work and uh, seeing how we, 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 we would like to transform uh, a mouse or a pig, and possibly a human heart, into a zebrafish heart for achieving endogenous regeneration. Okay, so basically this is the same scheme as before. If you take this uh, uh, blastocyst, this blastocyst is uh, uh, basically formed at uh, four or five days, and this is a time point where the blastocyst implants into the uterus wall and gives rise to a new organism. In 1981, Marcus Evans uh, made a very simple experiment in which he took a blastocyst from a mouse uh, disrupted the inner cell mass, put the cells in culture, and uh, uh, he uh, basically discovered two very, very surprising things at the time. First, that these cells were immortal, so they could grow these cells in certain conditions for indefinite periods of, of times without them changing their karyotype, without them becoming tumor cells, so a very specific cell type. Cell, cell, cell type. And then uh, the other thing that uh, she, uh, he, he knew is that if he takes these cells and implants these cells into another blastocyst, and suppose that these cells are marked with a gene that makes these cells uh, uh, blue, so it lacks the gene, then the embryo that is formed is a chimeria. So these cells can be, take part in the formation of any cell type and any organ in the body. So he, called, and the scientific community called these cells, embryonic stem cells, because these cells are virtually capable of becoming any cells of, of the body. So if you like uh, nomenclature, you could say that uh, uh, these uh, cells are pluripotent, so they can come any part, any cells in the body. If you implant an embryonic stem cells in a uterus, then uh, nothing happens. So there is a difference between the embryonic stem cells from the blastocyst and the zygote, because if you implant a zygote in the uterus, then there is a new organism. So basically, if you take a zygote and uh, you wait one division, you have two cells, you disgregate two cells, two uteri, and you have two organisms. You wait four cells, four uteri, four organisms, eight cells, uh, eight organisms, 
Then, uh, depending on the species from the stage of eight cells and the stage of 16 cells, this uh, uh, totipotency is lost, but still the cells in the blastocyst retain a multipotent capacity. This concept will become important also, also later. It took 17 years to show that uh, this uh, is exactly the same for humans. So basically, uh, uh, this is an experiment made by, by the Thompson in 1998. It's basically, he uh, fertilized an egg in the laboratory, grew the uh, uh, small embryo up to the blastocyst cell in the laboratory, disaggregated the inner cell mass, put the same in culture. In this case, he couldn't do, make a transgenic human, but uh, 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 basically, what he did was to show that these uh, cells, uh, human embryonic stem cells, can form any kind of cell in, uh, in the body. So basically, with, uh, it took 17 years because the culture condition of embryonic stem cells from the mouse and from humans are uh, significantly uh, uh, different. We know a lot now on embryonic stem cells. There has been a really an, an immense work from several uh, uh, top laboratories in, uh, in, uh, in the world. We know they they come from the blastocyst, they can renew indefinitely, they maintain a stable uh, karyotype. Uh, we know that they are clonogenic, so we can, from one cell, we can have a, a, a progeny, and, and that under specific conditions, we can differentiate them in uh, all cell types in the body. Obviously, there, is, there has been a tremendous work on understanding which are the molecular mechanisms that maintain pluripotency of these the cells and, the, and then drive their capacity to differentiate. There are a number of uh, 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 factors which have been identified to characterize these cells at the molecular level. The most important of these are uh, uh, three specific uh, transcription factors, which are called OCT4, NANOG, and SOX2. These are absolutely essential to maintain the proliferative uh, and indifferentiated cells state of embryonic stem cells. Again, uh, this uh, was the first clue to show that uh, the characteristic of a cell type is due to the characteristic of transcription factor that uh, this cell uh, expresses. For those of you who are not biologists, then transcription factor is a master factor that drives uh, a, a expression of a set of specific genes. So when we say that uh, there are 250 different cell types in our body means by cell type, a cell that has a specific function because it expresses specific proteins and it expresses the specific proteins because it has a specific set of transcription factors. So the identity of the cell is uh, due to the transcription factor the cell uh, 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 expresses. We don't, I don't want to enter into the biology of this, which is uh, very interesting, but uh, uh, out of the main scope of this, which is more uh, applicative of this presentation, which is more applicative, you might well argue, well, then I need the regeneration in the heart or I need the regeneration in the brain. The problem is solved. I take an embryonic stem cells, I put this uh, into the heart, uh, and I will go these cells regenerating the tissue. Uh, unfortunately, it's not so easy because if you do like that, uh, basically you, you don't obtain regeneration, but you obtain a tumor. So it is true that uh, if you take an embryonic stem cells, you put this in the heart, that these heart cells will start expanding, so replicating, and then differentiating. But this, it will do that in a very chaotic manner, forming big masses, more or less aggressive. If they are less aggressive, they are called teratomas. If they are more aggressive, they are called teratocarcinomas. And these masses, if you cut them, they are formed by basically all kinds of tissues. You have these chaotic masses in which you see some of the epidermis, the skin, some connected tissues, some cartilage, some bone, some red blood cells, some epithelia. And so these are very monstrous masses in which differentiation has occurred by completely unspecifically. Un, un, un However, what you can do with embryonic stem cells is uh, Instead of implanting embryonic stem cells in, uh, uh, in vivo, you can expand these cells in culture and obtain billions of embryonic stem cells and then convince these cells to become a differentiated cells. For example, you want to repair the heart, you simply convince this billion of cells to become a billion of cardiomyocytes. cells. This can be obtained now very easily because we know all the differentiation steps that drives from embryonic, that uh, leads embryonic stem cells to become cardiomyocytes, and we can modulate this uh, simply by adding or removing 
factors in the supernate and then changing the culture conditions. So you have one million, billion cells, embryonic stem cells, you have one billion cardiomyocytes, efficiency is now more than 90%, and you, uh, as you can see here, for example, this is in the mouse, these are embryonic stem cells derived cardiomyocytes that uh, so said that, that we convinced to become cardiomyocytes. They are cardiomyocytes because they expressed a cardiomyocyte-specific marker, which is alpha actin, staying red here. But most important, you see that these cultures start beating synchronously. And uh, for a culture of uh, cardiomyocytes, beating synchronous is a marker of differentiation because a cardiac cell in, in our heart beats synchronously because all cells are joined by a specific type of gap junction which contains proteins like Connexin 43 that permits a rapid passage of the mechanical information and electrical information. So just one single cell in the culture starts contracting, and this electrical signal is passed very rapidly to all the other cells that start beating synchronously. This is the reason why our heart beats synchronously, because of this uh, formation of these uh, gap junctions. So you take these cells, you implant them uh, in a mouse with a myocardial infarction or heart failure, you completely repair and regenerate the heart. So fantastic achievement. And this is exactly what is trying to do a laboratory in uh, uh, Seattle. Uh, Chuck Murray is uh, the P PI involved. He is working in monkeys as a very close model for myocardial uh, infarction. So he is basically ligating the coronary artery in monkeys, inducing damage to the heart, myocardial infarction, then he takes human embryonic stem cells converted into cardiomyocytes, he takes one billion of these cardiomyocytes, put them in the monkey, and he regenerates the wall. With a lot of problems still, because the implanting all these cells suddenly means also disturbing the electrical connectivity of the existing tissues. So these cells are, uh, they take time to make electrical connections with the rest of the myocardium. And so basically these monkeys have very severe uh, arrhythmias. And it is unclear whether these arrhythmias will prevent clinical use. Uh, Murray is believed that this uh, will not be a big prejudice. Others in, in the field are a bit more uh, cautious and, and skeptical. But this is the most advanced way of really regenerating the heart using stem cells. For those of you who have a religious belief, or in any case, uh, scientists have to take into account what is uh, the society he believes, uh, then uh, this uh, uh, would imply destroying uh, an embryo, because uh, to, for, to achieve uh, this kind uh, of uh, stem cell population and then transform this into cardiomyocytes or any other cell type, then uh, you would need to obtain an embryo by in vitro fertilization. And, uh, and destroy this embryo uh, at the stage of blastocyst, so after four or five days. So this means uh, creating an embryo in the laboratory and destroying this embryo. And uh, for example, for the Catholic Church, uh, this is not allowed. Here in Italy, we have a, a terrible law that doesn't even permit the creation of embryonic stem cells uh, line. Uh, for research purposes, which is very crazy because uh, scientists here in Italy who want to work on human embryonic stem cells simply cross the border to Switzerland, do the uh, embryonic stem cell derivation there, then they come back and they work with the cells because our law permits working and not, does not permit uh, uh, regenerating. There are a number of, uh, of, uh, this, of topics that might be uh, uh, interesting for for uh, uh, discussion in this case, for example, in the fertility clinics, uh, usually um, um, women who go to fertility clinics to have babies, they, there are several blastocysts that are generated during in vitro fertilization. Most of these are thrown away in the United States or here in Europe, in the Catholic country, they are saved in the refrigerator, but they cannot be used. So it would be simply, these cells could be used, these blastocysts could be used for for uh, uh, research, and it is also known that uh, in normal conditions, almost 20% of the zygotes do not implant after conception. So our the deficiency the that we humans have in terms of uh, of uh, generating babies is as low as 80% uh, of the blastocysts that are formed. Uh, they don't uh, they don't implant. In the United States, there has been uh, a strong reaction. Uh, against uh, uh, the creation of human embryonic stem cells 
uh, we were under the Bush administration, so the federal, the use of federal money for this application were forbidden. When uh, Obama came into power uh, um, uh, eight years ago, he released the use of uh, uh, public money, and uh, in 2009, a first trial uh, was uh, started with a very difficult application. So you heard yesterday, like you heard from Kempos uh, a few days ago that if you take a zebrafish, you cut, I'm sure he told you that, you cut the spinal cord, then after a while there is a 40 days, there is complete regeneration by the spinal cord, and there are some factors involved in this uh, activity. Well, if you take a human person who has a car accident, he has a damage to the spinal cord, instead there is no regeneration and uh, this person remains uh, paralyzed for the rest of his life. So this trial was aimed at injecting uh, um, human embryonic stem cells derived uh, neurons uh, into the spinal cord or uh, persons with a damage at the thoracic, thoracic level. A few patients uh, were injected, but then the trial uh, um, was uh, stopped and the company um, moved to cancer therapy. They lost uh, investor lost a lot of money on that, and the reason is that it is really difficult to think that regeneration of the neurons could occur so efficiently in terms of forming connections. So if you think of the spinal cord, motor neurons can be formed by injecting neurons inside the spinal cord, but you also need that these motor neurons emit an axons that travels for uh, uh, many, many centimeters to exactly reach the muscle that it should innervate. And this is really too demanding. As my opinion is too demanding also to think that we can have brain regeneration in Alzheimer's disease or in Parkinson's disease because we can have neuron regeneration and implantation and then thinking that these neurons make the same synapses as in normal conditions is very difficult, very difficult to conceive. There is an organ, however, in which uh, uh, the possibility of uh, uh, spontaneous regeneration is much uh, easier, and which this is the eye. Uh, this is work uh, uh, from um, uh, the um, Sasai laboratory, Yoshiki Sasai, a few years ago, and in which he showed that you can take embryonic stem cells uh, committed to become eye cells, and then they form an optical cap in the laboratory. So basically, these cells, even in cell culture, have the capacity to spontaneously differentiate and form a three-dimensional structure that resemble the eye. This uh, society, by, by the way, has a very tragic story because he, he has been uh, given a fantastic contribution to eye regeneration, to our understanding of uh, eye biology. Then, two years ago, he remained trapped in a fraud story that involved uh, one of the major centers of the Riken in Japan and a laboratory in Harvard, by which uh, there was the proof published in, uh, in uh, the false proof published in Nature that you can obtain embryonic stem cells simply taking a fibroblast and changing the pH of the medium. This turned out to be false. He found himself as one of the co-authors of this paper. He was one of the middle authors, so they gave not much contribution, but his pride and honor was so um, bloodily hard that he killed himself, so, so he committed suicide. Uh, uh, however, this idea of regenerating the eye using embryonic stem cells has moved to clinical trials. There are two groups uh, in the United States who are trying to regenerate the retina using human embryonic stem cells. Uh, the most advanced one is in the Boston area, and apparently uh, there are patients now that, uh, have, uh, that are, have recovered part of their uh, vision, at least the, the night vision, the black and white uh, visions of seeing shadows uh, using uh, embryonic stem cells uh, for regeneration of the retina. This is the state of the art for embryonic stem cells. Obviously, one question is, uh, can we avoid uh, going through this process uh, of uh, fertilizing uh, the, uh, uh, an egg with the sperm cell to obtain embryonic stem cells? So, uh, uh, so you were saying that uh, the implantation of these uh, uh, cells derived Uh, the 
Exactly, exactly. That could be a way, but uh, I mean, I suppose that, for example, if you take a heart, you would find a way of uh, implanting uh, uh, 10 million cells uh, every second day for uh, a long period, then these cells will uh, coordinate better with the existing cells. Obviously, this uh, is uh, clinically impracticable. So all what you can do is to do that uh, in a single in a single bolus in a single lamp. And this is for the heart. And then uh, uh, for the heart, there are other problems. So it is uh, the cells, uh, the cardiomyocytes that, that you can obtain in culture, in cell culture, from embryonic stem cells are embryonic cardiomyocytes. They are not the mature cells uh, that you find uh, in the adult cells. And there are some steps of maturation that still need uh, to, be, to be fulfilled by these cells. And uh, how to stimulate this further maturation is not known at the moment. Several laboratories are trying to find ways of stimulating maturation of, uh, of, uh, of these cells. Uh, I believe it is uh, more a technical problem than a conceptual problem. And I'm strongly convinced that uh, you could uh, uh, achieve a real regeneration uh, in planting stem cells on the other side for a mechanical organ like the, like the heart. Uh, I'm a bit more skeptical that this can be a solution for a disease that affects uh, 15 new million persons uh, every year in, in, in the world. So I, I, I see that a medicine based on having embryonic stem cells, 1 billion culture in the laboratory, differentiated into cardiomyocytes, implanted in the heart, is a medicine that would be destined to a very tiny fraction of very rich people in a very specialized clinics in the United States or, or in Europe, it's not a medicine for, for uh, to, to, to tackle a problem that is so spread and so important, also socially, as, uh, as heart disease. For the brain, I'm, I'm much more, uh, for the nervous system in particular, I'm much more skeptical because if you take, uh, 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 take a child when he's born, his uh, neurons have stopped dividing. So basically, uh, he has a, a certain number of neurons in his brain and uh, in his spinal cord. And then uh, this person, however, takes uh, 18 years to reach full maturation of his uh, intellectual functions. And this full maturation is not uh, cell production, but it just uh, uh, contacts, uh, synapse uh, formation. Can we really think that implanting in an adult uh, uh, said from the outside, uh, these neurons will make the same connections, uh, even projecting axons a uh, very distant part. I'm very skeptical about that. I, I find this very difficult to conceive, also very difficult to conceive that you can have projection going from one hemisphere to, uh, to the other one. Uh, during normal aging, uh, uh, in a normal person, you lose 10-15% uh, uh, of your normal neurons. In Alzheimer's, you lose uh, up to 30% of cholinergic neurons uh, all throughout the brain. How can you replace these uh, from exogenous stem cells? I find it very difficult. I, I would be... I mean, I'm, I'm 57, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm approaching more than you this uh, fatidic limit. So I would be the, the, the first to be pleased to be wrong, <laughs> but I find it very difficult at this moment. Yes, yes. Uh, sure. Why in development is this possible? Why hey, that's a big question. Okay. That's a big question. And uh, one should hope that uh, once implanting a cell in an adult individual, there are still there some uh, signals that uh, direct these neurons as they did during development. But I find it very difficult to conceive, very difficult. So how we, can we obtain embryonic stem cells without fertilization? So it is reached this stage here. 
And uh, the first experiment, uh, 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 trying to prove that this could be done, uh, was performed in frogs. Uh, this is a very old experiment uh, performed by, by um, Gurdon, who won the Nobel Prize in 2012 for this experiment. So he basically took uh, a, a frog and took a skin cell of the frog and took the nucleus of uh, uh, the, one of these skin cells and injected this nucleus into an egg. And then uh, uh, this egg started to develop this nucleus as it would for the product of fertilization. And uh, uh, basically, he obtained several uh, frogs which were identical genetically to the donor of the skin cells. And so they were cloned. This is what's called somatic cloning, so cloning from somatic cells. This happened in the 70s. And uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, and, and people tried to repeat this for uh, decades uh, in mammals, and they all failed. So the dogma was that this process of differentiation from embryonic stem cells towards differentiated cells was uh, irreversible, until everyone in the scientific community was a bit shocked by the publication by a group that uh, uh, was working at the. Uh, uh, Edinburgh University in an institute that now belongs to the Edinburgh University. It's called the Rosling Institute. The name of the scientist is a veterinarian, uh, is Jan Wilmut. And uh, uh, he showed in 1997 that basically you can apply the same principle to generate also a mammalian uh, organism, in that case, uh, the uh, sheep. So basically what he did was to take a cell from the mammary gland of a sheep. So this cell is a specialized cell producing milk proteins. And then he took these cells and uh, took another sheep from which uh, he recovered the egg cells. He sucked out the uh, nucleus of these egg cells with the pipette. So this egg cell remained just a small bag, an empty, an empty bag. And then he put the nucleus of these cells, the empty bag together, gave an electrical pulse, so more than 2,000 volts for a few um, uh, milliseconds. So this uh, depolarized the membrane so the nucleus can enter the cell. And at that point, this nucleus starts thinking of himself not as a specialized uh, a nucleus of the specialized cells to produce milk proteins, but uh, uh, as the nucleus which was the product of fertilization. And so he started to behave as a zygote, and then after a few days, a blastocyst were formed. He took the blastocyst and implanted the blastocyst on the third ship. And after a certain number of days, Dolly, the ship, was born. This is Dolly with her surrogate mother, so the mother that donated the uterus for creation. This was, was seen as a, I mean, a landmark discovery. Not, uh, uh, not, not, not for the reason that the newspaper reported it. So the, the process is still very inefficient. So um, uh, Wilmut cloned Dolly out of 243 attempts. And the efficiency in all mammalian species is in the order of 1%, 2% of the attempts. So it's impossible to think of using this for reproductive cloning. So you cannot you have armies of soldiers or clonal, uh, cl clonally identical, uh, because this is, this is uh, I mean, re really stupid. But uh, it, it was uh, a, a landmark moment in biology because it was uh, the first demonstration that in mammals you can basically revert genetic programs. So think uh, the, the, the way, again, I, I present this uh, 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 to the lay public by saying that it is a very nice metaphor. Suppose that you are taking a, a brand new computer home. You plug the computer into the... the wall uh, uh, outlet. Then uh, the, you open, switch on the computer, it starts loading the routines for the operating systems, and then you uh, are on your operating system and you say, well, now I want to do uh, a graph, uh, I want to analyze some data in Excel. So you start the Excel uh, application and uh, you input your data, you say, now I want to make a graph. And then you open the uh, Excel uh, uh, routine to prepare graphs, you work on the graph, you change the lines, you change the color, you change the from a bar to a pie chart, then you're happy, you print this graph, and you say, well, now I'm happy with my work, I want uh, uh, to go uh, and, and check my mail. And re you realize that uh, you have not uh, an exit or a quit command. 
So basically, you have a very brand new computer, a hard disk which is immense, hundreds of applications in the hard disk, but you have started working in Excel, and the only way you can use your computer for the rest of the life of the computer is to make that single graph in Excel. This is differentiation. So you start from the zygote, you end up with the cardiomyocytes, and this cardiomyocyte will remain a cardiomyocyte for uh, 85 years when the person will die. This cardiomyocyte will never become a neuron, a fibroblast, uh, and keratinocytes. In, in genetic terms, it is like thinking that we have 20,000 genes at the, at the time of fertilization. We are, out of these 20,000, we have uh, switched on, so we express proteins for these green genes. And then immediately after, you have blastocysts, so this remains home, but there are other four red genes. Then these are switched off, and then these cells start becoming cardiomyocytes. It becomes a mesoderm, so it has these blue genes, and then so on. And then it becomes a cardiomyocyte expressing actin, myosin, uh, actinin, troponin, and so on. It will remain a cardiomyocyte, so we never go back. What did Wilmot do? He unplugged the computer from the wall and replugged it. Or if, the, uh, as in no computer, there was a reset, a reset button, he pressed the reset button. So he unplugged and started the program again. It is the first demonstration that uh, any cell in our body has exactly the same information as uh, the zygote that formed us uh, years ago and has the potential to become another guy, zygote and to form a new organism. So it's all a matter of programs. It's not a matter of uh, information. It's a matter of applications, not a matter of uh, uh, hardware or uh, content uh, of, of information. Yes? The shortening? Why there should be shortening of DNA? No, <laughs> this slide is probably what you are meaning. It's not DNA that is shortened. It, was, it is that uh, uh, one of the theories of aging, one of the observations related to aging, is that cells uh, are born uh, in, in, during development with uh, uh, long repetitions of DNA at the extremity of telomeres. And then when cells uh, stop dividing after birth, the enzymes that makes the repetition is switched off. It's not expressed anymore. So this long repetition at every division becomes shorter. Every time the cell divides, it becomes shorter. And uh, at a certain point, it's so short that uh, the cell cannot replicate anymore. This was a theory that uh, uh, holds true 20 years ago. So this idea of telomere shortening the cause of aging. But it's not true at all. For example, cardiomyces stop dividing with very long telomeres. Neurons stop dividing with very long telomeres. Certainly, with short telomeres, you cannot divide. But this doesn't mean that you cannot age if, uh, if uh, um, you have long telomeres. At the beginning, when cloning of Dolly was performed, a laboratory in the UK made a study, a very rapid study, published in Nature, saying that the telomeres of Dolly were shorter than the telomeres of uh, the, the, the donor of the egg, the, the cell that, the ship that donated the, the mammary gland. And this, and, and all journals in the world reported this as saying that Dolly is born old. Uh, uh, this was completely false. In fact, the length of the telomeres was reanalyzed later and was shown to be as that of a normal sheep obtained by fertilization, normal fertilization. So basically, cloning resets the length of the telomeres. Simply, it reactivates the enzyme, which is called telomerase, that makes telomeres long, as tumor cells do, for example. Tumor cells grow indefinitely because they re-express uh, telomerase. In fact, a normal sheep dies, uh, lives about... 12 years, so the life expectancy of a sheep is 12 years. Dolly was uh, sacrificed at 10 years and a half, 11 years, because she was suffering, uh, and, uh, and so she was uh, euthanized, but she basically would have uh, made all her life through. And, and in fact, uh, again, also, if you look at other, other uh, species, uh, this is uh, in, uh, in, ca in, uh, in cows, you cloning resets the telomere length. 
you see that uh, these are other papers say extension of lifespan and telomerate and uh, uh, you can even uh, do uh, clone animals from senescent cells and they re completely reset the time the time information uh, so basically after dolly immediately mice were cloned goats were cloned pigs were clones uh, rabbit were clones and uh, and also pets were clones first cats then a scientist in, in Korea became very famous. His name is Vosu Huang. And because he, he did uh, the first cloning of a dog as a pet, the dog was called uh, Snoopy. And so this seems to work all uh, throughout the species. So there is no reason why it should not work uh, also in humans. And in humans, uh, it is a, a very important application uh, because uh, basically you can't use this for human infertility, but you can do a very simple thing. So you have a Suppose you have a patient uh, with uh, uh, a, a heart disease or a liver disease. He needs uh, regeneration of his uh, cells. So you can take a nucleus, for example, from a cell of the skin or for, for simply a, 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 a cell, white cells in the blood. You take the nucleus, you have an egg from a female donor. You transfer the nucleus into this egg and uh, you grow these cells in the laboratory until they form a blastocyst. Then you destroy the blastocyst, you put them, uh, the cells in culture, you obtain one billion cells, you transform these cells into cardiomyces or liver cells, you implant them in vivo, you have regenerated. The difference is enormous because uh, here we are working on the same cells as the patient, so it is his cells. It's not uh, donating cells from a donor. In fact, the monkeys, uh, of my, my friend Chuck Murray, uh, injected in the heart uh, uh, with human embryonic stem cells had to be immunocompromised because they were receiving uh, cells from uh, uh, another individual, another species in that case. Here instead, it's like having this patient, when uh, 70 years ago he was a blastocyst, somebody uh, uh, would have taken one cell of the blastocyst, put that in the freezer, and then thawed these cells and grow this again after 70 years when he needed these cells. That was really revolutionary. This is called therapeutic, therapeutic uh, cloning. Uh, it remained for many years unknown whether this was, uh, could be happened, uh, happen also in, in humans until this uh, Fo Su Huang published a paper in Science in 2004 that he obtained human embryonic uh, stem cell. Uh, but then something happened because uh, uh, this Fo Su Huang for which the Korean government built a big institute uh, for stem cell research in, in Seoul, became a sort of national, of national uh, hero. Then uh, a, a female person of his laboratory sued him because uh, he uh, apparently uh, uh, wanted their postdocs and peace students, female postdocs and peace students, to spontaneously donate eggs for uh, this kind of research. But donating an egg, uh, an egg, I mean, is a procedure that is used in fertility clinics, but it's, a, it's an invasive procedure, so you need uh, hormonal treatment, and then with the needle you have to recover the eggs and so on. He was apparently forcing. So a committee, an investigation committee was set up. He was investigated, and the investigation committee discovered that this not only was true, but also that uh, all the experiment on human uh, cloning were fabricated. Uh, and so there was a big scandal. He became uh, a sort of uh, uh, rejected person in Korea. He flew to California and set up a company where he clones uh, uh, pets. If you go to the website of this company, they even show you how to save cells from your dyed dog, putting the dog in the refrigerator. You can keep it uh, for uh, uh, two, three days, and then take a sample of cell. You send them to uh, this company, and uh, for 66 pounds, so you can obtain a clone of your favorite dog. In, if instead you want to spend, uh, you have to spend $100,000, you can have in even a copy, an exact copy of a dog called Tracker, which was a German shepherd uh, uh, who became famous in the 9-11 uh, disaster of the uh, Twin Towers in New York for having saved so many lives. So with $100,000, you can buy an exact genetic copy of, of these dogs. And uh, there is apparently a very, very florid market for this uh, among very wealthy people in the United States and in Europe. Nobody knew whether uh, this uh, human cloning 
was possible until uh, uh, 2013, when this uh, group in a private center in Oregon, in the United States, provided real proof that uh, there is no reason why humans could also not be cloned. The church, however, was not, uh, the Catholic Church was not happy at all at this moment, because cloning means that you don't have to create uh, an embryo because you obtain this uh, through uh, uh, the formation of a blastocyst through nuclear transfer, but still you have to destroy the blastocyst. And so the Catholic Church doesn't want to destroy blastocyst. And then the procedure is, 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 a, bit, is a bit cumbersome. And uh, the discussion immediately started when this person here, this is a picture taken uh, uh, one month ago in a congress in Finland, this person here uh, published a paper. He was also completely unknown to the field. Published a paper in Cell in 2006 showing that basically any cell in the body can become directly an embryonic stem cell. In the cloning uh, uh, procedure, uh, like Dolly, you don't obtain embryonic stem cell, you obtain the homologue of, of a zygote. And so uh, it is before the embryonic stem cells. Here, instead, he showed that you can take uh, uh, a fibroblast from the skin, you simply transfer into this fibroblast four transcription factors, which are this one in uh, red here and you transform a fibroblast directly into an embryonic stem cells that he called IPS, IPS cells. Uh, um, the, the, the guy who did this is Shinya Yamanaka, and Shinya has a very interesting story. He's a, an orthopedic surgeon uh, that at the age of 42 decided that uh, uh, orthopedic surgery was uh, very interesting but very limited to him. He wanted to do something for humanity, so he left completely surgery. He set up a laboratory and started to see if he could find a cocktail of transcription factor to do exactly like this, to transform any cell into an embryonic stem cells. And, and he uh, succeeded. He won the Nobel Prize in 2012 for this discovery, only six years after the discovery. The year later, one famous laboratory in embryonic stem cell research, Rudolf Jenisch at the MIT, proved that you can use these cells, injecting them in a blast of urethane a mouse. And now the situation is very, very different because you can uh, simply take uh, any cell type uh, on an individual, reprogram these cells with these uh, uh, transcription factors, and then you have embryonic stem cells you can expand and implant. So basically here uh, the church is also very happy because uh, uh, if you take one of these IPS cells, you put them in a uterus, nothing happens as an ES cells, and so you don't have to go through the creation and destruction of an embryo. And so everybody is happy. The problem is that, uh, in technical terms, uh, this is uh, uh, still not, uh, not very effective. And uh, 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 the application would be immense uh, because they are the same application of embryonic stem cells. So you could uh, cure uh, Parkinson's disease, spinal cord injury, heart failure, beta cell production, uh, liver failure, and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, the efficiency of this is still very low. So you can obtain an embryonic stem cell with this uh, Yamanaka factor, only one cell up to 10 to the 4. But uh, if our body is made by 10 to the 14 cells and 10% of these are in the liver, it means that the liver, my liver, your liver, is made by the 10 to the 13 cells. And obtaining 10 to the 13 cells, starting with an efficiency of 1%, uh, per, minor, per 10 minus 4, so 1 out of 10,000, is very difficult. However, uh, uh, this could be achieved in organs that are very small. And again, the retina comes into play. The retina is very small and is very, very defined. And in fact, uh, two years ago, the first trial for retinal uh, regeneration was started in the, uh, um, in, uh, again in Japan with the collaboration of Yamanaka and an ophthalmologist there who is called Masao Takahashi. Now, apparently, two people have been injected to regenerate the retina. The outcome is, uh, is very good. Uh, however, it appears that there are mutations that are introduced into these cells. So for safety reasons, this trial is being stopped now, and we will see where we will resume. I think that one of the major conceptual contributions of this work is that uh, to define, again, that you can change fate of cells simply changing transcription factor they express and forcing expression of transcription 
of transcription factor. For example, you can transform mesoderm cells into heart tissues with these transcription factors, or you can transform fibroblasts into cardiac cells with specific transcription factors. You can also convert fibroblasts to neurons that use dopamine uh, as a neurotransmitter with other specific transcription factors or uh, fibroblasts to neuroprogenitors or fibroblasts again to neurons. So basically, you can change all cell types simply changing the transcription factors uh, they uh, express. And I think that this is a, a very important uh, a piece, uh, piece of, uh, of information. So this is where we are now in terms of uh, application of stem cells for regeneration. Uh, everything is at, at a very experimental level. Uh, before ending, I'm seeing that I'm running late, so I, I, I will skip the last part, but I want just to leave you a, a notion. That is, if you take, uh, if you take uh, again, this scheme, uh, we are here, and these cells can really regenerate any kind of cell type. There are cells also here that uh, have the capacity of being stem cells, but these are much more specific, and uh, they can do only a specific cell type. And uh, here, uh, however, there has been uh, a lot of uh, um, publicity also on journals for, for, uh, for the lay public in stem cells uh, that can regenerate any kind of the body. You take stem cells from the adipose tissues, from the bone marrow, and they can regenerate anything. This has been, uh, has been uh, uh, supported by very uh, many uh, uh, big uh, uh, papers, also in important journals. At a certain point, 15 years ago, there was this notion uh, that, uh, for example, the bone marrow could become uh, brain, the brain could become muscle, the muscle could become blood, the blood would become vessels, the bone marrow could become liver, and, and so on. Somebody even, uh, even proposed that uh, in our circulation there are stem cells that circulate uh, like in a highway according to the exit they take, then they differentiate and specify into specific cell type. This has led to uh, thousands of patients injected with, for regeneration with cells taken from the bone marrow from the adipose tissue. And all this has failed. Uh, this is completely forbidden in Europe and the United States, but these are clinics in Thailand, in the former Soviet Union republics, in the Caribbean islands, in Costa Rica, which offer this miraculous stem cell treatment for incurable diseases. This is uh, totally bullshit, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, unfortunately, these treatments are, are very, very, uh, very, very um, uh, expensive. One of the laboratories who initially uh, tried to prove that bone marrow cells can regenerate the heart is a laboratory in Harvard who then went under investigation. There have been a couple of papers who have been retracted, and the, apparently there is an FBI investigation for misuse of federal funds in the order of 70 millions for, for uh, uh, this research. Uh, and so there are huge problems of, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in this because there is a huge demand by the public, by patients, and, but the only therapy for stem, adult stem cells that work are those based for regeneration of the blood, so hematopoietic stem cells, 50 years of bone marrow transplantation, or use or epithelial stem cells, so cells from the skin, essentially, that can be used for three applications. One is to regenerate the skin and the big burns. You have a kid with a big burn, you take a normal portion of the skin, put the epidermis in culture, you have big sheets of epidermis, and you put this into the, skin, into the wound. The, a similar application is uh, for the cornea. You have patients with uh, the, 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 the cornea, uh, which is, becomes opaque. You can regenerate this with the epithelial cells, or you can cover artificial scaffolds. This is a trachea made of an artificial material. You can cover this with uh, epithelial cells. These are the only applications of adult stem cells. This is how to regenerate organs with stem cells. But uh, as uh, we already mentioned, there are uh, other organs like fish and the urodils that regenerate organs through a completely different mechanism. So they have endogenous regeneration. And, and then tomorrow we will speak about that. Okay.